The Art of Bookmaking by Washington Irving. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Bonhoth. The Art of Bookmaking by Washington Irving. If that severe doom of Cynesius be true, it is a greater offense to steal men's labor than their clothes. What shall become of most writers? Burton's Anatomy of Melancholy I have often wondered at the extreme fecundity of the press, and how it comes to pass that so many heads on which nature seems to have inflicted the curse of barrenness should teem with voluminous productions. As a man travels on, however, in the journey of life, his objects of wonder daily diminish, and he is continually finding out some very simple cause for some great matter of marvel. Thus have I chanced, in my peregrinations about this great metropolis, to blunder upon a scene which unfolded to me some of the mysteries of the bookmaking craft, and at once put an end to my astonishment. I was, one summer's day, loitering through the great salons of the British Museum, with that listlessness with which one is apt to saunter about a museum in warm weather, sometimes lolling over the glass cases of minerals, sometimes studying the hieroglyphics on an Egyptian mummy, and sometimes trying, with nearly equal success, to comprehend the allegorical paintings on the lofty ceilings. Whilst I was gazing about in this idle way, my attention was attracted to a distant door, at the end of a suite of apartments. It was closed, but every now and then it would open, and some strange favored being, generally clothed in black, would steal forth and glide through the rooms without noticing any of the surrounding objects. There was an air of mystery about this which piqued my languid curiosity, and I determined to attempt the passage of that strait, and to explore the unknown regions beyond. The door yielded to my hand, with all that facility with which the portals of enchanted castles yield to the adventurous knight-errant. I found myself in a spacious chamber surrounded with great cases of venerable books. Above the cases, and just under the cornice, were arranged a great number of black-looking portraits of ancient authors. About the room were placed long tables, with stands for reading and writing, at which sat many pale, studious personages, poring intently over dusty volumes, rummaging among mouldy manuscripts, and taking copious notes of their contents. A hushed stillness reigned through this mysterious apartment, excepting that you might hear the racing of pens over sheets of paper, and occasionally the deep sigh of one of these sages, as he shifted position to turn over the page of an old folio, doubtless arising from that hollowness and flatulency incident of learned research. Now and then one of these personages would write something on a small slip of paper and ring a bell, whereupon a familiar would appear, take the paper in profound silence, glide out of the room, and return shortly loaded with ponderous tombs, upon which the other would fall tooth and nail with famished veracity. I had no longer a doubt that I had happened upon a body of magi, deeply engaged in the study of occult sciences. The scene reminded me of an old Arabian tale of a philosopher shut up in an enchanted library in the bosom of a mountain, which opened only once a year, where he made the spirits of the place bring him books of all kinds of dark knowledge, so that at the end of the year, when the magic portal once more swung open on its hinges, he issued forth so versed in forbidden lore as to be able to soar above the heads of the multitude and control the powers of nature. My curiosity being now fully aroused, I whispered to one of the familiars as he was about to leave the room, and begged an interpretation of the strange scene before me. A few words were sufficient for the purpose. I found that these mysterious personages, whom I had mistaken for magi, were principally authors, and were in the very act of manufacturing books. I was, in fact, in the reading-room of the great British library, an immense collection of volumes of all ages and languages, many of which are now forgotten, and most of which are seldom read, one of these sequestered pools of obsolete literature to which modern authors repair, and draw buckets full of classic lore, or pure English undefiled, wherewith to swell their own scanty rills of thought. Being now in possession of the secret, 
I sat down in a corner and watched the process of this book manufactory. I noticed one lean, bilis-looking wright, who sought none but the most worm-eaten volumes printed in black letter. He was evidently constructing some work of profound erudition that would be purchased by every man who wished to be thought learned, placed upon a conspicuous shelf in his library, or lain open upon his table, but never read. I observed him, now and then, draw a large fragment of biscuit out of his pocket, and gnaw, whether it was his dinner, or whether he was endeavouring to keep off that exhaustion of the stomach produced by much pondering over dry works, I leave to harder students than myself to determine. There was one dapper little gentleman, in bright-coloured clothes, with a chirping, gossiping expression of countenance, who had all the appearance of an author on good terms with his bookseller. After considering him attentively, I recognised in him a diligent gitter-up of miscellaneous works, which bustled off well with the trade. I was curious to see how he manufactured his wares. He made more stir and show of business than any of the others, dipping into various books, fluttering over the leaves of manuscripts, taking a morsel out of one, a morsel out of another, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. The contents of his book seemed to be as heterogeneous as those of the witch's cauldron in Macbeth. It was here a finger, there a thumb, toe of frog, blind worm's sting, with his own gossip poured in like baboon's blood to make the medley slab and good. After all, thought I, may not this pilfering disposition be implanted in authors for wise purposes? May it not be the way in which Providence has taken care that the seeds of knowledge and wisdom shall be preserved from age to age, in spite of the inevitable decay of the works in which they were first produced? We see that nature has wisely, though whimsically, provided for the conveyance of seeds from clime to clime in the maws of certain birds, so that animals, which in themselves are little better than carrion, and apparently the lawless plunderers of the orchards and cornfield, are, in fact, nature's carriers to disperse and perpetuate her blessings. In like manner, the beauties and fine thoughts of ancient and obsolete authors are caught up by these flights of predatory writers, and cast forth again to flourish and bear fruit in a remote and distant tract of time. Many of their works also undergo a kind of metempsychosis, and spring up under new forms. What was formerly a ponderous history revives in the shape of a romance, an old legend changes into a modern play, and a sober philosophical treatise furnishes the body for a whole series of bouncing and sparkling essays. Thus it is, in the clearing of our American woodlands, where we burn down a forest of stately pines, a progeny of dwarf oaks start up in their place, and we never see the prostate trunk of a tree mouldering in the soil, but it gives a birth to a whole tribe of fungi. Let us not, then, lament over the decay and oblivion into which ancient writers descend. They do but submit to the great law of nature, which declares that all sublimary shapes of matter shall be limited in their duration, but which decrees also that their element shall never perish. Generation after generation, both in animal and vegetable life, passes away, but the vital principle is transmitted to posterity, and the species continues to flourish. Thus also do authors beget authors, and having produced a numerous progeny, in a good old age they sleep with their fathers, that is to say, with the authors who preceded them, and from whom they had stolen. Whilst I was indulging in these rambling fancies, I leaned my head against a pile of reverend folios, whether it was owing to the spurific emanations of these works, or to the profound quiet of the room, or to the lassitude arising from much wandering, or to an unlucky habit of napping at improper times and places, with which I am grievously afflicted, so it was that I fell into a doze. Still, however, my imagination continued busy, and indeed the same scene continued before my mind's eye, only a little changed in some of the details. I dreamt that the chamber was still decorated with portraits of ancient authors, but that the number was increased, the long tables had disappeared, 
and in place of the sage magi i beheld a ragged and threadbare throng such as may be seen prying about the great repository of cast-off clothes monmouth street whenever they seized upon a book by one of those incongruities common to dreams methought it turned into a garment of foreign or antique fashion with which they proceeded to equip themselves i noticed however that no one pretended to clothe himself from any particular suit but took a sleeve from one a cape from another a skirt from a third thus decking himself out piecemeal while some of his original rags would peep out from among his borrowed finery there was a portly rosy well-fed parson whom i observed ogling several mouldy polemical writers through an eyeglass he soon contrived to slip on the voluminous mantle of one of the old fathers, and, having purloined the grey beard of another, endeavoured to look exceedingly wise, but the smirking commonplace of his countenance set at naught all the trappings of wisdom. One sickly-looking gentleman was busied embroidering a very flimsy garment with gold thread drawn out of several old court dresses of the reign of Queen Elizabeth another had trimmed himself magnificently from an illuminated manuscript had stuck a nosegay on his bosom culled from the paradise of dainty devices and having put sir philip sidney's hat on one side of his head strutted off with an exquisite air of vulgar elegance a third who was but of puny dimensions had bolstered himself out bravely with the spoils from several obscure tracts of philosophy so that he had a very imposing front but he was lamentably tattered in the rear and i perceived that he had patched his small clothes with scraps of parchment from a latin author there were some well-dressed gentlemen it is true who only helped themselves to a gem or so which sparkled among their own ornaments without eclipsing them some too seemed to contemplate the costumes of the old writers merely to imbibe their principles of taste and to catch their air and spirit but I grieve to say that too many were apt to array themselves from toe to toe in the patchwork manner I have mentioned. I shall not omit to speak of one genius, in drab breeches and gaiters and an Acadian hat, who had a violent propensity to the pastoral, but whose rural wanderings had been confined to the classic haunts of Primrose Hill and the solitudes of the Regent's Park he had decked himself in the wreaths and ribbons from all the old pastoral poets and hanging his head on one side went about with a fantastical lackadaisical air babbling about green field but the personage that most struck my attention was a pragmatical old gentleman in clerical robes with a remarkably large and square but bald head he entered the room wheezing and puffing elbowed his way through the throng with a look of sturdy self-confidence and having laid hands upon a thick greek quattro clapped it upon his head and swept majestically away in a formidable frizzled wig in the height of this literary masquerade a cry suddenly resounded from every side of thieves thieves i looked and lo the portraits about the walls became animated the old authors thrust out first a head then a shoulder from the canvas looked down curiously for an instant upon the motley throng and then descended with fury in their eyes to claim their rifled property the scene of scampering and hubbub that ensued baffles all description the unhappy culprits endeavoured in vain to escape with their plunder on one side might be seen half a dozen old monks stripping a modern professor on another there was sad devastation carried into the ranks of modern dramatic writers beaumont and fletcher side by side raged around the field like castor and pollux and sturdy ben jonson enacted more wonders than when a volunteer in the army in flanders as to the dapper little compiler of farragos mentioned some time since he had arrayed himself in as many patches and colours as harlequin and there was as fierce a contention of claimants about him as about the dead body of patroclus i was grieved to see many men to whom i had been accustomed to look up with awe and reverence fain to steal off with scarce a rag to cover their nakedness just then my eye was caught by the pragmatical old gentleman in the greek grizzled wig who was scrambling away in sore affright with half a score of authors in full cry after him they were close upon his haunches in a twinkling off went his wig at every turn some strip of raiment was peeled away until in a few moments from his domineering pomp 
he shrunk into a little Percy chopped bald shot, and made his exit with only a few tags and rags fluttering at his back. There was something so ludicrous in the catastrophe of this learned Theban that I burst into an immoderate fit of laughter, which broke the whole illusion. The tumult and scuffle were at an end. The chamber resumed its usual appearance. The old authors shrunk back into their picture frames and hung in shadowy solemnity along the walls. In short, I found myself wide awake in my corner, with the whole assemblage of hookworms gazing at me with astonishment. Nothing of my dream had been real but my burst of laughter, a sound never before heard in that grave sanctuary, and so abhorrent to the ears of wisdom as to electrify the fraternity. The librarian now stepped up to me, and demanded whether I had a card of admission. At first I did not comprehend him, but I soon found that the library was a kind of literary preserve, subject to game laws, that no one must presume to hunt there without special license and permission. In a word, I stood convicted of being an arrant poacher, and was glad to make a precipitous retreat, lest I should have the whole pack of authors let loose upon me. End of the Art of Bookmaking Beneath an Umbrella by Nathaniel Hawthorne This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Christopher Beneath an Umbrella by Nathaniel Hawthorne Pleasant is a rainy winter's day within doors. The best study for such a day, or the best amusement, call it which you will, is a book of travels, describing scenes the most unlike that somber one which is mistily presented through the windows. I have experienced that fancy is then most successful in imparting distinct shapes and vivid colors to the objects which the author has spread upon his page and that his words become magic spells to summon up a thousand varied pictures. Strange landscapes glimmer through the familiar walls of the room, and outlandish figures thrust themselves almost within the sacred precincts of the hearth. Small as my chamber is, it has space enough to contain the ocean-like circumference of an Arabian desert, its part sands tracked by the long lines of a caravan, with the camels patiently journeying through the heavy sunshine. Though my ceiling not be lofty, Yet I can pile in the mountains of Central Asia beneath it, till their summits shine far above the clouds of the middle atmosphere. And, with my humble means, a wealth that is not taxable, I can transport hither the magnificent merchandise of an oriental bazaar, and call a crowd of purchasers from distant countries, to pay a fair profit for the precious articles which are displayed on all sides. True it is, however, that amid the bustle of traffic, or whatever else may seem to be going on around me, the raindrops will occasionally be heard to patter against my window panes, which look forth upon one of the quietest streets in a New England town. After a time, too, the visions vanish, and will not appear again at my bidding. Then, it being nightfall, a gloomy sense of unreality depresses my spirits, and impels me to venture out, before the clock shall strike bedtime, to satisfy myself that the world is not entirely made up of such shadowy materials as have busied me throughout the day. A dreamer may dwell so long among fantasies that the things without him will seem as unreal as those within. When Eve has fairly set in, therefore, I sally forth, tightly buttoning my shaggy overcoat and hoisting my umbrella, the silken dome of which immediately resounds with the heavy drumming of the invisible raindrops. Pausing on the lowest doorstep, I contrast the warmth and cheerfulness of my deserted fireside with the drear obscurity and chill discomfort into which I am about to plunge. Now come fearful auguries, innumerable as the drops of rain. Did not my manhood cry shame upon me, I should turn back within doors, resume my elbow chair, my slippers, and my book, pass such an evening of sluggish enjoyment as the day has been, and go to bed inglorious. The same shivering reluctance, no doubt, has quelled for a moment the adventurous spirit of many a traveller, when his feet, which were destined to measure the earth around, were leaving their last tracks in the home paths. In my own case, poor human nature may be allowed a few misgivings. I look upward and discern no sky, not even an unfathomable void, but only a black impenetrable nothingness, as though heaven and all its lights were blotted from the system of the universe. It is as if nature were dead, and the world had put on black, and the clouds were weeping for her. With their tears upon my cheek, I turn my eyes earthward, but find little consolation here below. A lamp is burning dimly at the distant corner and throws just enough of light along the street 
to show and exaggerate by so faintly showing the perils and difficulties which beset my path. Yonder, dingily white remnant of a huge snowbank, which will yet cumber the sidewalk to the latter days of March. Over or through that wintry waste I must stride onward. Beyond lies a certain slough of despond, a concoction of mud and liquid filth, ankle deep, leg deep, neck deep, in a word, of unknown bottom, on which the lamplight does not even glimmer, but which I have occasionally watched in the gradual growth of its horrors, from morn till nightfall. Should I flounder into its depths, farewell to upper earth, and hark, how roughly resounds the roaring of a stream, the turbulent career of which is partially reddened by the gleam of the lamp, but elsewhere brawls noisily through the densest gloom. Oh, should I be swept away in fording that impetuous and unclean torrent, the corner will have a job with an unfortunate gentleman, who would fain end his troubles anywhere but in a mud puddle. Pshaw! I will linger not another instant at arm's length from these dim terrors, which grow more obscurely formidable the longer I delay to grapple with them. Now for the onset, and two, with little damage, save a dash of rain, in the face and breast, a splash of mud high up the pantaloons, and the left boot full of ice-cold water, behold me at the corner of the street. The lamp throws down a circle of red light around me, and twinkling onward from corner to corner, I discern other beacons marshalling my way to a brighter scene. But this is alone some dreary spot. The tall edifices bid gloomy defiance to the storm, with their blinds all closed, even as a man winks when he faces the spattering gust. How loudly tinkles the collected rain down the tin spouts! The puffs of wind are boisterous, and seem to assail me from various quarters at once. I have often observed that this corner is a haunt and loitering place for those winds which have no work to do upon the deep, dashing ships against our iron-bound shores, nor in the forest, tearing up the sylvan giants with half a root of soil at their vast roots. Here they must amuse themselves with lesser freaks of mischief. See, at this moment, how they assail yonder poor woman who is passing just within the verge of the lamplight. One blast struggles for her umbrella, and turns it wrong side outward. Another whisks the cape of her cloak across her eyes, while a third takes most unwarrantable liberties with the lower part of her attire. Happily, the good dame is no gossamer, but a figure of rotundity and fleshly substance. Else would these aerial tormentors whirl her aloft, like a witch upon a broomstick, and set her down, doubtless, in the filthiest kennel hereabout. From hence I tread upon firm pavements, into the center of the town. Here there is almost as brilliant an illumination as when some great victory has been won, either on the battlefield or at the poles. Two rows of shops, with windows down nearly to the ground, cast a glow from side to side, while the black night hangs overhead like a canopy, and thus keeps the splendor from diffusing itself away. The wet sidewalks gleam with a broad sheet of red light. The raindrops glitter, as if the sky were pouring down rubies. The spouts gush with fire. Methinks the scene is an emblem of the deceptive glare which mortals throw around their footsteps in the mortal world, thus bedazzling themselves, till they forget the impenetrable obscurity that hems them in, and that can be dispelled only by radiance from above. And, after all, it is a cheerless scene, and cheerless are the wanderers in it. Here comes one who has so long been familiar with tempestuous weather, that he takes the bluster of the storm for a friendly greeting, as if it should say, How fare ye, brother? He is a retired sea captain, wrapped in some nameless garment of the pea-jacket order, and is now laying his course towards the marine insurance office, there to spin yarns of gale and shipwreck with a crew of old sea-dogs like himself. The blast will put in its word among their hoarse voices, and be understood by all of them. Next I meet an unhappy slipshod gentleman, with a cloak flung hastily over his shoulders, running a race with boisterous winds, and striving to glide between the drops of rain. Some domestic emergency or other has blown this miserable man from his warm fireside in quest of a doctor. See that little vagabond? How carelessly he has taken his stand right underneath the spout, while staring at some object of curiosity in a shop window. Surely the rain is his native element. He must have fallen with it from the clouds, as frogs are supposed to do. Here is a picture, and a pretty one. A young man and a girl, both enveloped in cloaks, and huddled underneath the scanty protection of a cotton umbrella. She wears rubber overshoes, but he is in his dancing pumps, and they are on their way, no doubt, to Sonic Cotillion Party, or subscription ball, at a dollar a head, refreshments included. Thus they struggle against the gloomy tempest, lured onward by a vision of festal splendor. But ah, most lamentable disaster! Bewildered by the red, blue, and yellow meteors, 
in an apothecary's window, they have stepped upon a slippery remnant of ice, and are precipitated into a confluence of swollen floods at the corner of two streets. Luckless lovers! Were it my nature to be other than a looker-on in life, I would attempt your rescue. Since that may not be, I vow, should you be drowned, to weave such a pathetic story of your fate, as shall call forth tears to drown you both anew. Do ye touch bottom, my young friends? Yes. They emerge like water nymph and a river deity, and paddle hand in hand out of the depths of the dark pool. They hurry homeward, dripping, disconsolate, abashed, but with love too warm to be chilled by cold weather. They have stood a test which proves too strong for many, faithful, though over head and ears in trouble. Onward I go, deriving a sympathetic joy or sorrow from the varied aspect of mortal affairs, even as my figure catches a gleam from the lighted windows, or is blackened by an interval of darkness. Not that mine is altogether a chameleon spirit, with no hue of its own. Now I pass into a more retired street, where the dwellings of wealth and poverty are intermingled, presenting a range of strongly contrasted pictures. Here, too, may be found the golden mean. Through yonder casement I discern a family circle, the grandmother, the parents, and the children, all flickering, shadow light in the glow of a wood fire. Bluster, fierce blast and beat, thou wintry rain, against the window panes. Ye cannot damp the enjoyment of that fireside. Surely my fate is hard, that I should be wandering homeless here, taking to my bosom night, and storm, and solitude, instead of wife and children. Peace, murmurer! Doubt not that darker guests are sitting round the hearth, though the warm blaze hides all but blissful images. Well, here is still a brighter scene. A stately mansion, illuminated for a ball, with cut glass chandeliers and alabaster lamps in every room, and sunny landscapes hanging round the walls. See, a coach has stopped, whence emerges a slender beauty, who, canopy by two umbrellas, glides within the portal and vanishes amid lightsome thrills of music. Will she ever feel the night wind and the rain? Perhaps, perhaps. And will death and sorrow ever enter that proud mansion? As surely as the dancers will be gay within its halls tonight. Such thoughts sadden, yet satisfy my heart, for they teach me that the poor man, in his mean weather-beaten hovel, without a fire to cheer him, may call the rich his brother, brethren by sorrow, who must be an inmate of both their households, brethren by death, who will lead them both to other homes. Onward, still onward, I plunge into the night. Now have I reached the outmost limits of the town, where the last lamp struggles feebly with the darkness, like the farthest star that stands sentinel on the borders of uncreated space. It is strange what sensations of sublimity may spring from a very humble source. Such are suggested by this hollow roar of a subterranean cataract, where the mighty stream of a kennel precipitates itself beneath an iron gate, and is seen no more on earth. Listen a while to its voice of mystery, and fancy will magnify it till you start and smile at the illusion. And now another sound, the rumbling of wheels, as the mail coach, outward bound, rolls heavily off the pavement, and splashes through the mud and water of the road. All night long, the poor passengers will be tossed to and fro between drowsy watch and troubled sleep, and will dream of their own quiet beds, and awake to find themselves still jolting onward. Happy are my lot, who will straightway hie me to the familiar room, and toast myself comfortably before the fire, musing, and fitfully dozing, and fancying a strangeness in which such sights, as all may see. But first let me gaze at this solitary figure, who comes hitherward with a tin lantern, which throws the circular pattern of its punched holes on the ground about him. He passes fearlessly into the unknown gloom, whither I will not follow him. This figure shall supply me with a moral, wherewith, for lack of a more appropriate one, I may wind up my sketch. He fears not to tread the dreary path before him, because his lantern, which was kindled at the fireside of his home, will light him back to that same fireside again. And thus we, night wanders through a stormy and dismal world, if we bear the light of faith, and kindled with a celestial fire, it will surely lead us home to that heaven whence its radiance was borrowed. End of Beneath an Umbrella The Box Tunnel by Charles Reed This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Ruth Golding. The Box Tunnel by Charles Reed. The ten fifteen train glided from Paddington, May the seventh, eighteen forty seven. In the left compartment of a certain first class carriage were four passengers. Of these, two were worth description. The lady had a smooth, white, delicate brow, strongly marked eyebrows, long lashes, eyes that seemed to change colour, and a good-sized, delicious mouth, with teeth as white as milk. A man could not see her nose for her eyes and mouth. Her own sex could and would have told us some nonsense about it. She wore an unpretending greyish dress, buttoned to the throat with lozenge-shaped buttons, and a Scottish shawl that agreeably evaded colour. She was like a duck, so tight her plain feathers fitted her, and there she sat, smooth, snug, and delicious, with a book in her hand and a soupçon of her wrist just visible as she held it. Her opposite neighbour was what I call a good style of man, the more to his credit, since he belonged to a corporation that frequently turns out the worst imaginable style of young men. He was a cavalry officer, aged twenty-five. He had a moustache, but not a very repulsive one, not one of those sub-nasal pigtails on which soup is suspended like dew on a shrub. It was short, thick, and black as a coal. His teeth had not yet been turned by tobacco smoke to the colour of juice. His clothes did not stick to nor hang to him. He had an engaging smile, and what I liked the dog for, his vanity, which was inordinate, was in its proper place, his heart, not in his face jostling mine and other people's who have none. In a word, he was what one oftener hears of than meets a young gentleman. He was conversing in an animated whisper with a companion, a fellow officer. They were talking about what it is far better not to, women. Our friend clearly did not wish to be overheard, for he cast ever and anon a furtive glance at his fair vis-a-vis -vis and lowered his voice. She seemed completely absorbed in her book, and that reassured him. At last the two soldiers came down to a whisper, the truth must be told. The one who got down at Slough, and was lost to posterity, bet ten pounds to three, that he who was going down with us to Bath and immortality would not kiss either of the ladies opposite upon the road. Done! Done! Now I am sorry a man I have hitherto praised should have lent himself even in a whisper, to such a speculation. But nobody is wise at all hours, not even when the clock is striking five and twenty. And you are to consider his profession, his good looks, and the temptation, ten to three. After Slough the party was reduced to three. At Twilford one lady dropped her handkerchief, Captain Dolignan fell on it like a lamb. Two or three words were interchanged on this occasion. At Reading, the Marlborough of our tale made one of the safe investments of that day. He bought a Times and Punch, the latter full of steel pen thrusts and woodcut. Valour and beauty deigned to laugh at some inflamed humbug or other, punctured by punch. Now laughing together, thaws our human ice. Long before Swindon it was a talking match. At Swindon, who so devoted as Captain Dolignan? He handed them out, he souped them, he tough-chickened them, he brandied and cochineeled one, and he brandied and burnt-sugared the other. On their return to the carriage, one lady passed into the inner compartment to inspect a certain gentleman's seat on that side of the line. Reader, had it been you or I, the beauty would have been the deserter. The average one would have stayed with us till all was blue, ourselves included. Not more surely does our slice of bread and butter, when it escapes from our hand, revolve it ever so often, 
a light face downward on the carpet. But this was a bit of a fop, Adonis, dragoon, so Venus remained in tete-a-tete -tete with him. You have seen a dog meet an unknown female of his species. How handsome, how empresse, how expressive he becomes. Such was Dolignon after Swindon. And to do the dog justice, he got handsome and handsomer. And you have seen a cat conscious of approaching cream. Such was Miss Haythorne. She became demurer and demurer. Presently our captain looked out of the window and laughed. This elicited an inquiring look from Miss Haythorne. We're only a mile from the box tunnel. Do you always laugh a mile from the box tunnel? said the lady. Invariably. What for? Why, <clears throat> it is a gentleman's joke. Captain Dolignon then recounted to Miss Haythorne the following. A lady and her husband sat together going through the box tunnel. There was one gentleman opposite. It was pitch dark. After the tunnel, the lady said, George, how absurd of you to salute me going through the tunnel. I did no such thing. You didn't? No. Why? Because somehow I thought you did. Here Captain Dolignon laughed, and endeavoured to lead his companion to laugh, but it was not to be done. The train entered the tunnel. Miss Haythorn. Ah! Dolignon. What is the matter? Miss Haythorn. I am frightened. Dolignon. Moving to her side. Pray, do not be alarmed. I am near you. Miss Haythorn. You are near me. Very near me indeed, Captain Dolignon. Dolignon. You know my name? Miss Haythorn. I heard you mention it. I wish we were out of this dark place. Dolignon. I could be content to spend hours here reassuring you, my dear lady. Miss Haythorn. Nonsense! Dolignon. <sniffs> Grave reader, do not put our lips to the next pretty creature you meet, who will understand what this means. Miss Haythorn. Ee! Ee! Friend. What is the matter? Miss Haythorn. Open the door! Open the door! There was a sound of hurried whispers. The door was shut and the blind pulled down with hostile sharpness. If any critic falls on me for putting inarticulate sounds in a dialogue as above, I answer with all the insolence I can command at present, hit boys as big as yourself. Bigger, perhaps, such as Sophocles, Euripides and Aristophanes, they began it, and I learned it of them sore against my will. Miss Haythorne's scream lost most of its effect, because the engine whistled forty thousand murders at the same moment, and fictitious grief makes itself heard, when real cannot. Between the tunnel and bath, our young friend had time to ask himself, whether his conduct had been marked by that delicate reserve which is supposed to distinguish the perfect gentleman. With a long face, real or feigned, he held open the door. His late friends attempted to escape on the other side. Impossible! They must pass him. She whom he had insulted, Latin for kissed, deposited somewhere at his feet a look of gentle, blushing reproach. The other, whom he had not insulted, darted red-hot daggers at him from her eyes, and so they parted. It was perhaps fortunate for Dolignan that he had the grace to be a friend to Major Hoskins of his regiment, a veteran laughed at by the youngsters, for the Major was too apt to look coldly upon billiard-balls and cigars. He had seen cannon-balls and linstocks. He had also, to tell the truth, swallowed a good bit of the mess-room poker, which made it as impossible for Major Hoskins to descend to an ungentlemanlike word or action as to brush his own trousers below the knee. Captain Dolignon told this gentleman his story in gleeful accents, but Major Hoskins heard him coldly, 
and as coldly answered that he had known a man to lose his life for the same thing. That is nothing, continued the Major, but unfortunately he deserved to lose it. At this blood mounted to the younger man's temples, and his senior added, I mean to say, he was thirty-five. You, I presume, are twenty-one. Twenty-five? That is much the same thing. Will you be advised by me? If you will advise me. Speak to no one of this, and send White the three pounds, that he may think you have lost the bet. That is hard, when I won it. Do it, for all that, sir. Let the disbelievers in human perfectibility know that this dragoon capable of a blush did this virtuous action, albeit with violent reluctance, and this was his first damper. A week after these events he was at a ball. He was in that state of factitious discontent which belongs to us amiable English. He was looking in vain for a lady equal in personal attraction to the idea he had formed of George Dolignan as a man, when suddenly there glided past him a most delightful vision, a lady whose beauty and symmetry took him by the eyes. Another look. It can't be. Yes, it is. Miss Haythorn. Not that he knew her name, but what an apotheosis. The duck had become a peahen, radiant, dazzling. She looked twice as beautiful, and almost twice as large as before. He lost sight of her. He found her again. She was so lovely she made him ill. And he alone must not dance with her, speak to her. If he had been content to begin her acquaintance the usual way, it might have ended in kissing. It must end in nothing. As she danced, Sparks of beauty fell from her on all around but him. She did not see him. It was clear she never would see him. One gentleman was particularly assiduous. She smiled on his assiduity. He was ugly, but she smiled on him. Dolignan was surprised at his success, his ill taste, his ugliness, his impertinence. Dolignan at last found himself injured. Who was this man? And what right had he to go on so? He never kissed her, I suppose, said Dolly. Dolignan could not prove it, but he felt that somehow the rights of property were invaded. He went home and dreamed of Miss Haythorne, and hated all the ugly successful. He spent a fortnight trying to find out who his beauty was. He never could encounter her again. At last he heard of her in this way. A lawyer's clerk paid him a little visit, and commenced a little action against him in the name of Miss Haythorne for insulting her in a railway train. The young gentleman was shocked, endeavoured to soften the lawyer's clerk, that machine did not thoroughly comprehend the meaning of the term. The lady's name, however, was at last revealed by this untoward incident. From her name to her address was but a short step, and the same day our crestfallen hero lay in wait at her door, and many a succeeding day, without effect. But one fine afternoon she issued forth quite naturally, as if she did it every day, and walked briskly on the parade. Dolignan did the same, met and passed her many times on the parade, and searched for pity in her eyes, but found neither look nor recognition, nor any other sentiment. For all this she walked and walked, till all the other promenaders were tired and gone. Then her culprit summoned resolution, and taking off his hat with a voice for the first time tremulous, besought permission to address her. She stopped, blushed, and neither acknowledged nor disowned his acquaintance. He blushed, stammered out how ashamed he was, how he deserved to be punished, how he was punished, how little she knew 
how unhappy he was, and concluded by begging her not to let all the world know the disgrace of a man who was already mortified enough by the loss of her acquaintance. She asked an explanation. He told her of the action that had been commenced in her name. She gently shrugged her shoulders and said, How stupid they are! Emboldened by this, he begged to know whether or not a life of distant, unpretending devotion would, after a lapse of years, erase the memory of his madness, his crime. She did not know. She must now bid him adieu, as she had some preparations to make for a ball in the Crescent, where everybody was to be. They parted, and Dolignan determined to be at the ball where everybody was to be. He was there and after some time he obtained an introduction to Miss Haythorne, and he danced with her. Her manner was gracious. With the wonderful tact of her sex, she seemed to have commenced the acquaintance that evening. That night, for the first time, Dolignan was in love. I will spare the reader all a lover's arts by which he succeeded in dining where she dined, in dancing where she danced, in overtaking her by accident when she rode. His devotion followed her to church, where the dragoon was rewarded by learning there is a world where they neither polk nor smoke, the two capital abominations of this one. He made an acquaintance with her uncle, who liked him, and he saw at last with joy that her eye loved to dwell upon him when she thought he did not observe her. It was three months after the box tunnel that Captain Dolignan called one day upon Captain Haythorne, R.N., whom he had met twice in his life, and slightly propitiated by violently listening to a cutting-out expedition. He called, and in the usual way asked permission to pay his addresses to his daughter. The worthy captain straightway began doing quarter-deck, when suddenly he was summoned from the apartment by a mysterious message. On his return he announced, with a total change of voice, that it was all right, and his visitor might run alongside as soon as he chose. My reader has divined the truth. This nautical commander, terrible to the foe, was in complete and happy subjugation to his daughter, our heroine. As he was taking leave, Dolignan saw his divinity glide into the drawing-room. He followed her, observed a sweet consciousness, deepen into confusion. She tried to laugh, and cried instead, and then she smiled again. When he kissed her hand at the door, it was... George and Marion, instead of Captain this and Miss the other. A reasonable time after this, for my tale is merciful and skips formalities and torturing delays, these two were very happy. They were once more upon the railroad, going to enjoy their honeymoon all by themselves. Marion Dolignan was dressed just as before, duck-like, and delicious, all bright except her clothes. But George sat beside her this time, instead of opposite, and she drank him in gently from her long eyelashes. Marion, said George, married people should tell each other all. Will you ever forgive me if I own to you no? Yes, yes. Well, then, you remember the box tunnel? This was the first allusion he had ventured to it. I am ashamed to say I had three pounds to ten pounds with white. I would kiss one of you two ladies. And George, pathetic externally, chuckled within. I know that, George, I overheard you, was the demure reply. Oh, you overheard me? Impossible! And did you not hear me whisper to my companion, I made a bet with her. You made a bet? How singular! What was it? Only a pair of gloves, George. Yes, I know, but what about it? 
that if you did, you should be my husband, dearest. Oh, but stay, then you could not have been so very angry with me, love. Why, dearest, then you brought that action against me? Mrs. Dolignan looked down. I was afraid you were forgetting me. George, you will never forgive me? Sweet angel, why, here is the box tunnel. Now, reader, fie, no, no such thing. You can't expect to be indulged in this way every time we come to a dark place. Besides, it is not the thing. Consider two sensible married people. No such phenomenon, I assure you, took place. No scream in hopeless rivalry of the engine this time. End of the Box Tunnel Recording by Ruth Golding A Cup of Tea by Catherine Mansfield This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org a Cup of Tea by Catherine Mansfield Rosemary Fell was not exactly beautiful. No, you couldn't have called her beautiful. Pretty? Well, if you took her to pieces. But why be so cruel as to take anyone to pieces? She was young, brilliant, extremely modern, exquisitely well-dressed, amazingly well read in the newest of the new books and her parties were the most delicious mixture of the really important people and artists quaint creatures discoveries of hers some of them too terrifying for words but others quite presentable and amusing rosemary had been married for two years she had a duck of a boy no not peter michael and her husband absolutely adored her they were rich really rich not just comfortably well off which is odious and stuffy and sounds like one grandparents but if rosemary wanted to shop she would go to paris as you and i would go to bond street if she wanted to buy flowers the car pulled up at that perfect shop in regent street and Rosemary inside the shop just gazed in a dazzled, rather exotic way, and said, "'I want those, and those, and those. Give me four bunches of those, and that jar of roses. Yes, I'll have all the roses in the jar. No, no lilac. I hate lilac. It's got no shape.' The attendant bowed and put the lilac out of sight as though this was only too true lilac was dreadfully shapeless give me those stumpy little tulips those red and white ones and she was followed to the car by a thin shop girl staggering under an immense white paper armful that looked like a baby in clothes one winter afternoon she had been buying something in a little antique shop in curzon street it was a shop she liked for one thing one usually had it to oneself. And then the man who kept it was ridiculously fond of serving her. He beamed whenever she came in. He clasped his hands. He was so gratified he could scarcely speak. Flattery, of course. All the same, there was something. You see, madam, he would explain in his low, respectful tones, I love my things. I would rather not part with them than sell them to someone who does not appreciate them, who has not that fine feeling which is so rare. And breathing deeply, he unrolled a tiny square of blue velvet and pressed it on the glass counter with his pale fingertips. Today it was a little box. He had been keeping it for her. He had shown it to nobody as yet. An exquisite little animal box with a glaze so fine it looked as though it had been baked in cream. 
on the lid a minute creature stood on the flowery tree, and a more minute creature still had her arms round his neck. Her hat, really no bigger than a geranium petal, hung from a branch. It had green ribbons, and there was a pink cloud like a watchful cherub floating above their heads. Rosemary took her hands out of her long gloves. She always took off her gloves to examine such things. Yes, she liked it very much. She loved it. It was a great duck. She must have it. And, turning the creamy box, opening and shutting it, she couldn't help noticing how charming her hands were against the blue velvet. The shopman, in some divin cavern of his mind, may have dared to think so too, for he took a pencil, leant over the counter, and his pale bloodless fingers crept timidly towards those rosy flashing ones, as he murmured gently, If I may venture to point out to madam the flowers on the little lady's bodice. Charming! Rosemary admired the flowers. But what was the price? For a moment the shopman did not seem to hear. Then a murmur reached her. Twenty-eight guineas, ma'am. Twenty-eight guineas! Rosemary gave no sign. She laid the little box down. She buttoned her gloves again. Twenty-eight guineas, even if one is rich. She looked vague. She stared at a plump tea kettle like a plump hand above the shopman's head, and her voice was dreamy as she answered, "'Well, keep it for me, will you? I'll—' But the shopman had already bowed, as though keeping it for her was all any human being could ask. He would be willing, of course, to keep it for her forever. The discreet door shut with a click. She was outside on the step, gazing at the winter afternoon. Rain was falling, and with the rain it seemed the dark came too, spinning down like ashes. There was a cold, bitter taste in the air, and the new-lighted lamps looked sad. Sad where the light in the houses opposite. Dimly they burned, as if regretting something. And people hurried by, hidden under their hateful umbrellas. Rosemary felt a strange pang. She pressed her muff against her breast. She wished she had a little box, too, to cling to. Of course, the car wasn't there. She'd only to cross the pavement. But still she waited. There are moments, horrible moments in life, when one emerges from shelter and looks out, and it's awful. One oughtn't to give way to them, one ought to go home and have an extra special tea. But at the very instant of thinking that, a young girl, thin, dark, shadowy, where had she come from, was standing at Rosemary's elbow, and a voice, like a sigh, almost like a sob, breathed, Madam, may I speak to you a moment? Speak to me? Rosemary turned. She saw a little battered creature with enormous eyes, someone quite young, no older than herself, who clutched at a coat collar with reddened hands, and shivered, as though she had just come out of the water. Madam, stammered a voice, would you let me have the prize of a cup of tea? A cup of tea? There was something simple, sincere in that voice. It wasn't in the least a voice of a beggar. Then you have no money at all? asked Rosemary. None, madam, came the answer. How extraordinary! Rosemary peered through the dusk, and the girl gazed back at her. How more than extraordinary! And suddenly it seemed to Rosemary such an adventure. It was like something out of a novel by Dostoevsky, this meeting in the dusk. Supposing she took the girl home, supposing she did do one of those things she was always reading about or seeing on the stage, what would happen? It would be thrilling. And she heard herself saying afterwards to the amazement of her friends, I simply took her home with me. 
as she stepped forward and said to the dim person beside her, "'Come home to tea with me.' The girl drew back startled. She even stopped shivering for a moment. Rosemary put out a hand and touched her arm. "'I mean it,' she said, smiling, and she felt how simple and kind her smile was. "'Why won't you? Do come home with me now in my car and have tea.' "'You... you don't mean it, madam,' said the girl, and there was pain in her voice. "'But I do,' cried Rosemary. "'I want you to. To please me. Come along.' The girl put her fingers to her lips, and her eyes devoured Rosemary. "'You're... you're not taking me to the police station?' she stammered. "'The police station?' Rosemary laughed out. "'Why should I be so cruel? No, I only want to make you warm, and to hear anything you care to tell me.' Hungry people are easily led. The footman held the door of the car open, and a moment later they were skimming through the dusk. "'There,' said Rosemary. She had a feeling of triumph as she slipped her hand through the velvet strap. She could have said, "'Now I've got you,' as she gazed at the little captive she had netted. But of course she meant it kindly. Oh, more than kindly, she was going to prove to this girl that wonderful things did happen in life, that fairy godmothers were real, that rich people had hearts, and that women were sisters. She turned impulsively, saying, "'Don't be frightened. After all, why shouldn't you come back with me? We're both women. If I'm the more fortunate, you ought to expect.' But happily at that moment, for she didn't know how the sentence was going to end, the car stopped. The bell was rung, the door opened, and with a charming, protecting, almost embracing movement, Rosemary drew the other into the hall. Warmth, softness, light, a sweet scent, all those things so familiar to her she never even thought about them, she watched that other receive. It was fascinating. She was like the rich little girl in her nursery, with all the cupboards to open, all the boxes to unpack. "'Come, come upstairs,' said Rosemary, longing to begin to be generous. "'Come up to my room.' And besides, she wanted to spare this poor little thing from being stared at by the servants. She decided as they mounted the stairs she would not even ring for Jean, but take off her things by herself. The great thing was to be natural. And there, cried Rosemary again, as they reached a beautiful big bedroom with the curtains drawn, the fire leaping on her wonderful lacquer furniture, her gold cushions, and the primrose and blue rugs. The girl stood just inside the door. She seemed dazed. But Rosemary didn't mind that. "'Come and sit down,' she cried, dragging her big chair up to the fire. "'In this comfy chair. Come and get warm. You look so dreadfully cold.' "'I daren't, madam,' said the girl, and she edged backwards. "'Oh, please,' Rosemary ran forward. "'You mustn't be frightened. You mustn't, really. Sit down, and when I've taken off my things, we shall go into the next room and have tea and be cosy. "'Why are you afraid?' And gently she half pushed the thin figure into its deep cradle. But there was no answer. The girl stayed just as she had been put, with her hands by her sides and her mouth slightly open. To be quite sincere, she looked rather stupid. But Rosemary wouldn't acknowledge it. She leant over her, saying, "'Won't you take off your hat? Your pretty hair is all wet.' And one is so much more comfortable without a hat, isn't one? There was a whisper that sounded like, Very good, madam. And the crushed hat was taken off. And let me help you off with your coat, too, said Rosemary. The girl stood up, but she held on to the chair with one hand and let Rosemary pull. 
It was quite an effort. The other scarcely helped her at all. She seemed to stagger like a child, and the thought came and went through Rosemary's mind that if people wanted helping they must respond a little, just a little, otherwise it became very difficult indeed. And what was she to do with the coat now? She left it on the floor, and the hat too. She was just going to take a cigarette off the mantelpiece when the girl said quickly, but so lightly and strangely, I, I'm very sorry, madam, but I'm going to faint. I, I shall go off, madam, if I don't have something. Good heavens, how thoughtless I am! Rosemary rushed to the bell. Tea, tea at once, and some brandy immediately! The maid was gone again, but the girl almost cried out, "'No, I don't want no brandy. I never drink brandy. It's a cup of tea I want, madam.' And she burst into tears. It was a terrible and fascinating moment. Rosemary knelt beside her chair. "'Don't cry, poor little thing,' she said. "'Don't cry?' And she gave the other her lace handkerchief. She really was touched beyond words. She put her arm round those thin, bird-like shoulders. Now at last the other forgot to be shy, forgot everything except that they were both women, and gasped out, "'I can't go on no longer like this. I can't bear it. I can't bear it. I shall do away with myself. I can't bear no more.' "'You shan't have to. I look after you. Don't cry any more.' "'Don't you see what a good thing it was that you met me? "'We'll have tea, and you'll tell me everything, "'and I shall arrange something, I promise. "'Do stop crying, it's so exhausting, please.' "'The other girl did stop just in time for Rosemary to get up before the tea came. "'She had the table placed between them. "'She plied the poor little creature with everything, "'all the sandwiches, all the bread and butter, and every time her cup was empty she filled it with tea, cream, and sugar. People always said sugar was so nourishing. As for herself, she didn't eat. She smoked and looked away tactfully, so that the others should not be shy. And really the effect of that slight meal was marvellous. When the tea-table was carried away, a new being, a large frail creature with tangled hair, dark lips, deep, lighted eyes, lay back in the big chair in a kind of sweet languor looking at the blaze. Rosemary lit a fresh cigarette. It was time to begin. "'And when did you have your last meal?' she asked softly. But at that moment the door-handle turned. "'Rosemary, may I come in?' It was Philip. "'Of course.' He came in. "'Oh, I am so sorry,' he said, and stopped, and stared. "'It's quite all right,' said Rosemary, smiling. "'This is my friend, Miss—' "'Smith, madam,' said a languid figure, who was strangely still and unafraid. "'Smith,' said Rosemary, "'we are going to have a little talk.' "'Oh, yes,' said Philip, "'quite,' and his eye caught sight of the coat and hat on the floor. He came over to the fire and turned his back to it. "'It's a beastly afternoon.' he said curiously, still looking at that listless figure, looking at its hands and boots, and then at Rosemary again. "'Yes, isn't it?' said Rosemary enthusiastically. "'Vile!' Philip smiled his charming smile. "'As a matter of fact,' said he, "'I wanted you to come into the library for a moment, would you? Will Miss Smith excuse us?' The big eyes were raised to him, but Rosemary answered for her. "'Of course she will.' and they went out of the room together. "'I say,' said Philip, when they were alone, "'explain, who is she? What does it all mean?' Rosemary, laughing, leaned against the door and said, "'I picked her up in Curzon Street, really. She's a real pick-up. She asked me for the price of a cup of tea, and I brought her home with me.' "'But what on earth are you going to do with her?' cried Philip. "'Be nice to her,' said Rosemary quickly. "'Be frightfully nice to her.' Look after her. I don't know how. We haven't talked yet. But show her, treat her, make her feel. My darling girl, 
said Philip. You're quite mad, you know. It simply can't be done. I knew you'd said that, retorted Rosemary. Why not? I want to. Isn't that a reason? And besides, one's always reading about these things. I decided. But, said Philip slowly, and he cut the end of a cigar. She's so astonishingly pretty. Pretty? Rosemary was so surprised that she blushed. Do you think so? I... I hadn't thought about it. Good Lord! Philip struck a match. She's absolutely lovely. Look again, my child. I was bowed over when I came into your room just now. However, I think you're making a ghastly mistake. Sorry, darling, if I'm crude and all that, but let me know if Miss Smith is going to dine with us in time for me to look up the Milliner's Gazette. You absurd creature, said Rosemary, and she went out of the library, but not back to her bedroom. She went to her writing room and sat down at her desk. Pretty, absolutely lovely, bowed over, her heart beat like a happy bell. Pretty, lovely, she drew her cheque-book towards her, but no, cheques would be of no use, of course. She opened a drawer and took out five pound notes, looked at them, put two back, and holding the three squeezed in her hand, she went back to her bedroom. Half an hour later, Philip was still in the library when Rosemary came in. I only wanted to tell you, said she, and she leaned against the door again and looked at him with a dazzled, exotic gaze. Miss Smith won't dine with us to night. Philip put down the paper. Oh, what's happened? previous engagement rosemary came over and sat down on his knee she insisted on going said she so i gave the poor little thing a present of money i couldn't keep her against her will could i she added softly rosemary had just done her hair darkened her eyes a little and put on her pearls she put up her hand and touched philip's cheeks do you like me said she and a tone sweet husky troubled him i like you awfully he said and he held her tighter kiss me there was a pause then rosemary said dreamily i saw a fascinating little box to-day it cost twenty-eight guineas may i have it philip jumped her on his knee you may little wasteful one said he but that was not really what Rosemary wanted to say. Philip, she whispered, and she pressed his head against her bosom. Am I pretty? End of A Cup of Tea by Catherine Mansfield Recorded by Julie van Mallichem The End of the Battle by Stephen Crane this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or how to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Today's reading by David Pittard, Keller, Texas. The End of the Battle by Stephen Crane A sergeant, a corporal, and fourteen men of the Twelfth Regiment of the line had been sent out to occupy a house on the main highway. They would be at least a half of a mile in advance of any other picket of their own people. Sergeant Morton was deeply angry at being sent on this duty. He said that he was overworked. There were at least two sergeants, he claimed furiously, whose turn it should have been to go on this arduous mission. He was treated unfairly. He was abused by his superiors. Why did any damn fool ever join the army? As for him, he would get out of it as soon as possible. He was sick of it, the life of a dog. All this he said to the corporal, who listened attentively giving grunts of respectful assent. On the way to this post, two privates took occasion to drop to the rear and pilfer in the orchard of a deserted plantation. When the sergeant discovered this absence, he grew black with rage, which was an accumulation of all his irritations. Run, you, he howled. Bring them here. I'll show them. A private ran swiftly to the rear. The remainder of the squad began to shout nervously at the two delinquents, whose figures they could see in the deep shade of the orchard hurriedly picking fruits from the ground and cramming it within their shirts, next to their skins. 
The beseeching cries of their comrades stirred the criminals more than did the barking of the sergeant. They ran to join the squad while holding their loaded bosoms and with their mouths open with aggrieved explanations. Jones faced the sergeant with a horrible cancer marked in bumps on his left side. The disease of Patterson showed quite around the front of his waist in many protuberances. A nice pair, said the sergeant, with sudden frigidity. You're the kind of soldiers a man wants to choose for a dangerous outpost duty, ain't you? The two privates stood at attention, still looking much aggrieved. We only, began Jones huskily. Oh, you only, cried the sergeant. Yes, you only. I know all about that, but if you think you're going to trifle with me... A moment later, the squad moved on towards its station. Behind the sergeant's back, Jones and Patterson were shyly passing apples and pears to their friends, while the sergeant expounded eloquently to the corporal. You see what kind of men are in the army now? Why, when I joined the regiment, it was a very different thing, I can tell you. Then a sergeant had some authority, and if a man disobeyed orders, he had a very small chance of escaping something extremely serious. But now, good God! If I report these men, the captain will look over a lot of beastly orderly sheets and say, Haw, oh, mm, well, Sergeant Morton, these men seem to have a very good records, very good records indeed. I can't be too hard on them. No, not too hard, continued the sergeant. I tell you, Flagler, the army is no place for a decent man. Flagler, the corporal, answered with the sincerity of appreciation, which with him had become a science. I think you're right, Sergeant, he answered. Behind them, the privates mumbled discreetly. Damn this sergeant of ours. He thinks we are made of wood. I don't see any reason for all this strictness when we are on active service. It isn't like being at home in barracks. There's no great harm in a couple of men dropping out to raid an orchard of the enemy when all the world knows that we haven't had a decent meal in twenty days. The reddened face of Sergeant Morton suddenly showed to the rear. A little more marching and a little less talking, he said. When he came to the house he had been ordered to occupy, the sergeant sniffed with his stain. These people must have lived like cattle, he said angrily. To be sure, the place was not alluring. The ground floor had been used for the housing of cattle, and it was dark and terrible. A flight of steps led to the lofty first floor, which was denuded but respectable. The sergeant's visage lightened when he saw the strong walls of stone and cement. Unless they turn their guns on us, they will never get us out of here, he said cheerfully to the squad. The men, anxious to keep him in an amiable mood, all hurriedly grinned and seemed very appreciative and pleased. I'll make this into a fortress, he announced. He sent Jones and Patterson, the two orchard thieves, out on sentry duty. He worked the others then until he could think of no more things to tell them to do. Afterwards he went forth with a major general's serious scowl and examined the ground in front of his position. In returning he came upon a sentry, Jones, munching an apple. He sternly commanded him to throw it away. The men spread their blankets on the floors of the bare rooms, and putting their packs under their heads and lighting their pipes, they lived in easy peace. Bees hummed in the garden, and a scent of flowers came through the open window. A great fan-shaped bit of sunshine smote the face of one man, and he indolently cursed as he moved his primitive bed to a shadier place. Another private explained to a comrade, This is all nonsense, anyhow. No sense in occupying this post. They... But of course, said the corporal, when she told me herself that she cared more for me than she did for him, I wasn't going to stand any of his talk. The corporal's listener was so sleepy that he could only grunt his sympathy. There was a sudden little spatter of shooting. A cry from Jones rang out. With no intermediate scrambling, the sergeant leapt straight to his feet. Now, he cried, let us see what you are made of. If, he added bitterly, you are made of anything. A man yelled, Good God! Can't you see you're all tangled up in my cartridge belt? Another man yelled, Keep off my legs! Can't you walk on the floor? To the windows there was a blind rush of slumbering men, who brushed hair from their eyes even as they made ready their rifles. Jones and Patterson came stumbling up the steps, crying dreadful information. Already the enemy's bullets were spitting and singing over the house. The sergeant suddenly was stiff and cold with a sense of the importance of the thing. Wait until you see one, he drawled loudly and calmly, then shoot. For some moments the enemy's bullets swung swifter than lightning over the house without anybody being able to discover a target. 
In this interval, a man was shot in the throat. He gurgled and lay down on the floor. The blood slowly waved down the brown skin of his neck while he looked meekly at his comrades. There was a howl. There they are. There they come. The rifles crackled. A light smoke drifted idly through the rooms. There, there was a strong odor as if from burnt paper and the powder of firecrackers. The men were silent. Through the windows and about the house, the bullets of an entirely invisible enemy moaned, hummed, spat, burst, and sang. The men began to curse. Why can't we see them, they muttered through their teeth. The sergeant was still frigid. He answered soothingly, as if he were directly responsible for this behavior of the enemy. Wait a moment. You'll soon be able to see them. There, give it to them. A little skirt of black figures had appeared in a field. It was really like shooting at an upright needle from the full length of a ballroom. But the men's spirits improved as soon as the enemy, this mysterious enemy, became a tangible thing and far off. They had believed the foe to be shooting at them from the adjacent garden. Now, said the sergeant ambitiously, we can beat them off easily if you men are good enough. A man called out in a tone of quick, great interest. See that fellow on horseback, Bill? Isn't he on horseback? I thought he was on horseback. There was a fusillade against another side of the house. The sergeant dashed into the room which commanded the situation. He found a dead soldier on the floor. He rushed out howling, When was Niles killed? When was Niles killed? When was Niles killed? Damn it, when was Niles killed? It was absolutely essential to find out the exact moment this man had died. A blackened private turned upon his sergeant and demanded, How in hell do I know? Sergeant Morton had a sense of anger so brief that in the next second he cried, Patterson! He had even forgotten his vital interest in the time of Niles' death. Yes, said Patterson, his face set with some deep-rooted quality of determination. Still, he was a mere farm boy. Go into Niles' window and shoot at those people, said the sergeant hoarsely. Afterwards he coughed. Some of the fumes of the fight had made way to his lungs. Patterson looked at the door into this other room. He looked at it as if he suspected it was to be his death chamber. Then he entered and stood across the body of Niles and fired vigorously into a group of plum trees. They can't take this house, declared the sergeant in a contemptuous and argumentative tone. He was apparently replying to somebody. The man who had been shot in the throat looked up at him. Eight men were firing from the windows. The sergeant detected in a corner three wounded men talking together feebly. Don't you think there's anything to do, he bawled. Go and get Niles' cartridge and give them to somebody who can use them. Take sentences, too. The man who had been shot in the throat looked at him. Of the three wounded men who had been talking, one said, My leg is all doubled up under me, sergeant, he spoke apologetically. Meantime, the sergeant was reloading his rifle. His foot slipped in the blood of the man who had been shot in the throat, and the military boot made a greasy red streak on the floor. Why, we can hold this place, shouted the sergeant jubilantly. Who says we can't? Corporal Flagler suddenly spun away from his window and fell in a heap. Sergeant murmured a man as he dropped to a seat on the floor, out of danger. I can't stand this. I swear I can't. I think we should run away. Morton, with the kindly eyes of a good shepherd, looked at the man. You're afraid, Johnston. You're afraid, he said softly. The man struggled to his feet, cast upon the sergeant a gaze full of admiration, reproach, and despair, and returned to his post. A moment later he pitched forward, and thereafter his body hung out of the window, his arms straight and his fists clenched. Incidentally, his corpse was pierced afterwards by a chance three times by bullets of the enemy. The sergeant laid his rifle against the stonework of the window frame and shot with care until his magazine was empty. Behind him, a man simply grazed on the elbow, was wildly sobbing like a girl. Damn it, shut up, said Morton, without turning his head. Before him was a vista of a garden, fields, clumps of trees, woods, populated at the time with little fleeting figures. He grew furious. Why didn't he send me orders, he cried aloud. The emphasis on the word he was impressive. A mile back on the road, a galloper of the hussars lay dead beside his dead horse. The man who had been grazed on the elbow still set up his bleat. Morton's fury veered to this soldier. Can't you shut up? Can't you shut up? Can't you shut up? Fight! That's the thing to do. Fight! A bullet struck Morden, and he fell upon the man who'd been shot in the throat. There was a sickening moment. Then the sergeant rolled off to a position upon the bloody floor. 
He turned himself with a last effort and Dilly could look at the wounded who were able to look at him. Kim up, the kickers, he said thickly. His arms weakened and he dropped on his face. After an interval, a young subaltern of the enemy's infantry, followed by his eager men, burst into this reeking interior. But just over the threshold, he halted before the scene of blood and death. He turned with a shrug to his sergeant. God, I should have estimated them at least one hundred strong. End of recording. An Enigmatic Nature by Anton Chekhov Read for LibriVox.org An Enigmatic Nature by Anton Chekhov On the red velvet seat of a first-class railway carriage, a pretty lady sits half-reclining. An expensive, fluffy fan trembles in her tightly closed fingers. A pince-nez keeps dropping off her pretty little nose. The brooch heaves and falls on her bosom, like a boat on the ocean. She is greatly agitated. On the seat opposite sits the Provincial Secretary of Special Commissions, a budding young author, who from time to time publishes long stories of high life, or novelli, as he calls them, in the leading paper of the province. He is gazing into her face, gazing intently with the eyes of a connoisseur. He is watching, studying, catching every shade of this exceptional, enigmatic creature. He understands it. He fathoms it. Her soul, her whole psychology, lies open before him. Oh, oh, I understand. I understand you to your inmost depths says the secretary of special commissions, kissing her hand near the bracelet. Your sensitive, responsive soul is seeking to escape from the maze of— Yes, the struggle is terrific, titanic. But do not lose heart. You will be triumphant. Yes. Write about me, Valdemar, says the pretty lady, with a mournful smile. My life— has been so full, so varied, so checkered. Above all, I am unhappy. I am a suffering soul in some page of Dostoevsky. Reveal my soul to the world, Voldemar. Reveal my hapless soul. You are a psychologist. We have not been on the train an hour together, and you have already fathomed my heart. Tell me, I beseech you, tell me. Listen. My father was a poor clerk in the service. He had a good heart and was not without intelligence. But the spirit of the age, of his environment, vous comprenez? I do not blame my poor father. He drank, gambled, took bribes. My mother. But why say more? Poverty. The struggle for daily bread, the consciousness of insignificance. Ah, do not force me to reveal it. I had to make my own way. You know the monstrous education at a boarding school, foolish novel reading, the errors of early youth, the first time flutter of love. It was awful. The vacillation and the agonies of losing faith in life, in oneself. Ah, you are an author. You know us women. You will understand. Unhappily, I have an intense nature. I looked for happiness. And what happiness? I long to set my soul free. Yes, in that was my happiness. Exquisite creature, murmured the author, kissing her hand close to the bracelet. It's not you I am kissing, but the suffering of humanity. Do you remember Rashkolnikov and his kiss? Oh, Voldemar, I longed for glory, renown, success like every— Why affect modesty, every nature above the commonplace? I yearn for something extraordinary, above the common lot of women. And then, and then— 
There crossed my path an old general, well off. Understand me, Valdemar. It was self-sacrifice, renunciation. You must see that. I could do nothing else. I restored the family fortunes, was able to travel, to do good. Yet how I suffered! How revolting, how loathing to me were his embraces! Though I will be fair to him, he had fought nobly in his day. There were moments, terrible moments, but I was kept up by the thought that from day to day the old man might die, that I would begin to live as I liked, to give myself to the man I adored, be happy. There is such a man, Voldemar, indeed there is. The pretty lady flutters her fan more violently. Her face takes a lachrymose expression. She goes on. But at last the old man is dead. He left me something. I was free as a bird in the air. Now is the moment for me to be happy, isn't it, Voldemar? Happiness comes tapping at my window. I had only to let it in, but— Voldemar, listen, I implore you. Now is the time for me to give myself to the man I love, to become the partner of his life, to help to uphold his ideals, to be happy, to find rest. But how ignoble, repulsive and senseless all our life is. How mean it is, Voldemar. I am wretched, wretched, wretched. And again, there is an obstacle in my path. Again, I feel my happiness is far, far away. Ah, oh, what anguish! If only you knew what anguish! But what? What stands in your way? I implore you, tell me. What is it? Another old general. Very well off. The broken fan conceals the pretty little face. The author props on his fist his thoughts, heavy brow, and ponders with the air of a master in psychology. The engine is whistling and hissing, while the window curtains flush red with the glow of the setting sun. End of An Enigmatic Life Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake This recording is in the public domain. The Image of the Lost Soul by Saki This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jamie Ash Young There were a number of carved stone figures placed at intervals along the parapets of the old cathedral. Some of them represented angels, others kings and bishops, and nearly all were in attitudes of pious exaltation and composure. But one figure, low down on the cold north side of the building, had neither crown, mitre, nor nimbus, and its face was hard and bitter and downcast. It must be a demon, declared the fat blue pigeons, that roosted and sunned themselves all day on the ledges of the parapet. But the old belfry jackdaw, who was an authority on ecclesiastical architecture, said it was a lost soul. And there the matter rested. One autumn day there fluttered onto the cathedral roof a slender, sweet-voiced bird that had wandered away from the bare fields and thinning hedgerows in search of a winter roosting place. 
It tried to rest its tired feet under the shade of a great angel wing, or to nestle in the sculptured folds of a kingly robe. But the fat pigeons hustled it away from wherever it settled, and the noisy sparrow folk drove it off the ledges. No respectable bird sang with so much feeling. They cheeped to one another, and the wanderer had to move on. Only the effigy of the lost soul offered a place of refuge. The pigeons did not consider it safe to perch on a projection that leaned so much out of the perpendicular, and was, besides, too much in the shadow. The figure did not cross its hands in the pious attitude of the other graven dignitaries, but its arms were folded as in defiance, and their angle made a snug resting place for the little bird. Every evening it crept trustfully into its corner against the stone breast of the image, and the darkling eyes seemed to keep watch over its slumbers. The lonely bird grew to love its lonely protector, and during the day it would sit from time to time on some rain shoot or other abutment and trill forth its sweetest music in grateful thanks for its nightly shelter. And it may have been the work of wind and weather, or some other influence, but the wild, drawn face seemed gradually to lose some of its hardness and unhappiness. Every day, through the long, monotonous hours, the song of his little guest would come up in snatches to the lonely watcher. And at evening, when the vesper bell was ringing, and the great gray bats slid out of their hiding places in the belfry roof, the bright-eyed bird would return, twitter a few sleepy notes, and nestle in the arms that were waiting for him. Those were the happy days for the dark image. Only the great bell of the cathedral rang out its daily mocking message after joy, sorrow. The folk in the verger's lodge noticed a little brown bird flitting about the cathedral precincts and admired its beautiful singing. But it is a pity, said they, that all that warbling should be lost and wasted far out of hearing up on the parapet. They were poor, but they understood the principles of political economy. So they caught the bird and put it in a little wicker cage outside the lodge door. That night the little songster was missing from its accustomed haunt, and the dark image knew more than ever the bitterness of loneliness. Perhaps his little friend had been killed by a prowling cat, or hurt by a stone. Perhaps... Perhaps he had flown elsewhere. But when morning came there floated up to him, through the noise and bustle of the cathedral world, a faint, heart-aching message from the prisoner in the wicker cage, far below. And every day, at high noon, when the fat pigeons were stupefied into silence after their midday meal, and the sparrows were washing themselves in the street puddles, the song of the little bird came up to the parapets, a song of hunger and longing and hopelessness, a cry that could never be answered. The pigeons remarked between meal times that the figure leaned forward more than ever out of the perpendicular. One day no song came up from the little wicker cage. It was the coldest day of winter, and the pigeons and sparrows on the cathedral roof looked anxiously on all sides for the scraps of food which they were dependent on in hard weather. "'Have the large folk thrown out anything onto the dust heap?' inquired one pigeon of another, which was peering over the edge of the north parapet. "'Only a little dead bird,' was the answer. There was a crackling sound in the night on the cathedral roof, and a noise as of falling masonry. The belfry jackdaw said the frost was affecting the fabric, and as he had experienced many frosts, it must have been so. 
In the morning it was seen that the figure of the lost soul had toppled from its cornice, and now lay in a broken mass on the dust heap outside the verger's lodge. It is just as well, cooed the fat pigeons, after they had peered at the matter for some minutes. Now we shall have a nice angel put up there. Certainly they will put an angel there. After joy, sorrow, rang out the great bell. End of the Image of the Lost Soul Monday or Tuesday by Virginia Woolf This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Monday or Tuesday by Virginia Woolf Lazy and indifferent, shaking space easily from his wings, Knowing his way, the hero passes over the church beneath the sky, Light and distant, absorbed in itself. Endlessly, the sky covers and uncovers, Moves and remains. A lake? Blot the shores out of it. A mountain? Oh, perfect! The sun gold on its slopes. Down that falls. Ferns, then, are white feathers, Forever and ever, Desiring truth, Awaiting it, Laboriously distilling a few words. Forever desiring, A cry starts to the left, Another to the right. Wheels strike divergently, Omnibuses conglomerate in conflict, Forever desiring, the clock asseverates with twelve distinct strokes that it is midday. Light sheds gold scales. Children swarm, forever desiring truth. Red is the dome, coins hang on the trees. Smoke trails from the chimneys. Bark, shout, cry, iron for sale. And truth. Radiating to appoint men's feet and women's feet, black or gold-encrusted. This foggy weather, sugar, no thank you, the commonwealth of the future, the firelight darting and making the room red, save for the black figures in their bright eyes, while outside of the end discharges. This thin dummy drinks tea at her desk, and plate glass preserves fur coats. Flaunted, leaf-light, drifting at corners, Blown across the wheels, silver splashed. Home or not home, gathered, scattered. Squandered in separate scales, swept up. Down, torn, sunk, assembled. And truth, now to recollect by the fireside on the white square of marble. From ivory depth, words rising shed their blackness. Blossom and penetrate. Fall in the book, in the flame, in the smoke, in the momentary sparks. Or now, voyaging, the marble square pendant. Minarets beneath in the Indian seas, While space rushes blue and stars glint, Truth, content with closeness, Lazy and indifferent the heron returns, The sky veils her stars, then bears them. End of Monday or Tuesday On the Decay of the Art of Lying By Mark Twain this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Julie von Mallichem. On the Decay of the Art of Lying by Mark Twain. Essay for Discussion read at the meeting of the historical and antiquarian club of hartford and offered for the thirty dollar prize did not take the prize observe i do not mean to suggest that the custom of lying has suffered any decay or interruption no for the lie as a virtue a principle is eternal the lie as a recreation, a solace, a refuge in time of need, the fourth grace, 
the tenth mute, man's best and surest friend, is immortal, and cannot perish from the earth, while this club remains. My complaint simply concerns the decay of the art of lying. No high-minded man, no man of right feeling, can contemplate the lumbering and slovenly lying of the present day without grieving to see a noble art so prostituted. In this veteran presence I naturally enter upon this theme with diffidence. It is like an old maid trying to teach nursery matters to the mothers in Israel. It would not become to me to criticize you, gentlemen, who are nearly all my elders and my superiors in this thing. If I should here and there seem to do it, I trust it will in most cases be more in a spirit of admiration than fault-finding. Indeed, if this finest of the fine arts had everywhere received the attention, the encouragement, and conscientious practice and development which this club has devoted to it, I should not need to utter this lament, or shred a single tear. I do not say this to flatter. I say it in a spirit of just and, and appreciative recognition. It had been my intention at this point to mention names and to give illustrative specimens, but indications observable about me admonished me to beware of the particulars and confine myself to generalities. No fact is more firmly established than that lying is a necessity of our circumstances. The deduction that it is in then a virtue goes without saying. No virtue can reach its highest usefulness without careful and diligent cultivation. Therefore it goes without saying that this one ought to be taught in the public schools, even in the newspapers. What chance has in the ignorant and cultivated liar against the educated expert? What chance have I against Mr. Per against a lawyer. Judicious lying is what the world needs. I sometimes think it were even better and safer not to lie at all than to lie injudiciously. An awkward, unscientific lie is often as ineffectual as the truth. Now, let us see what the philosophers say. Note that venerable proverb, children and fools always speak the truth. The deduction is plain. Adults and wise persons never speak it. Parkman the historian says, The principle of truth may itself be carried into an absurdity. In another place in the same chapters he says, The saying is old that truth should not be spoken at all times, and those whom a sick conscience worries into habitual violation of the maxim are imbeciles and nuisances. It is strong language, but true. None of us could live with an habitual truth-teller. Thank goodness none of us has to. A habitual truth-teller is simply an impossible creature. He does not exist, he never has existed. Of course there are people who think they never lie, but it is not so. And this ignorance is one of the very things that shame our so-called civilization. Everybody lies, every day, every hour, awake, asleep, in his dreams, in his joy, in his mourning. If he keeps his tongue still, his hands, his feet, his eyes, his attitude will convey deception, and purposely. Even in sermons, but that is a platitude. In a far country, where I once lived, the ladies used to go around paying calls, under the humane and kindly pretense of wanting to see each other, and when they returned home they would cry out with a glad voice, saying, We made sixteen calls and found fourteen of them out, not meaning that they found out anything important against the fourteen, no, that was only a colloquial phrase to signify that they were not at home and their manner of saying it expressed their lively satisfaction in that fact. Now their pretense of wanting to see the fourteen and the other two whom they had been less lucky with, 
was that commonest and mildest form of lying which is sufficiently described as a deflection from the truth. Is it justifiable? Most certainly. It is beautiful. It is noble. For its object is not to reap profit, but to convey a pleasure to the sixteen. The iron saw truth monger would plainly manifest or even utter the fact that he didn't want to see those people, and he would be an ass and afflict totally unnecessary pain. And next, those ladies in that far country, but never mind, they had a thousand pleasant ways of lying that grew out of gentle impulses, and were a credit to their intelligence and an honour to their hearts. Let the particulars go. The men in that far country were liars, every one. Their mere how de do was a lie because they didn't care how you did, except they were undertakers. To the ordinary inquiry you lied in return, for you made no conscientious diagnostic of your case, but answered at random, and usually missed it considerably. You lied to the undertaker and said that your health was failing, a wholly commendable lie since it cost you nothing and pleased the other man. If a stranger called and interrupted you, you said with your hearty tongue, I'm glad to see you, and said with your heartiest soul, I wish you were with the cannibals and it was dinner time. When he went, you said regretfully, Must you go? and followed it with a call again, but you did no harm, for you did not deceive anybody nor inflict any hurt whereas the truth would have made you both unhappy. I think that all this gorgeous lying is a sweet and loving art, and should be cultivated. The highest perfection of politeness is only a beautiful edifice, built from the base to the dome of graceful and gilded forms of charitable and unselfish lying. What I bemoan is the growing prevalence of the brutal truth. Let us do what we can to eradicate it. An injurious truth has no merit over an injurious lie. Neither should ever be uttered. The man who speaks an injurious truth, lest his soul be not saved if he do otherwise, should reflect that that sort of a soul is not strictly worth saving. The man who tells a lie to help a poor devil out of trouble is one of whom the angels doubtless say, Lo, here is a heroic soul who casts his own welfare in jeopardy to succour his neighbours. Let us exalt this magnanimous liar. An injurious lie is an uncommendable thing, and so also, and in the same degree, is an injurious truth a fact that is recognized by the law of libel. Among other common lies we have the silent lie, the deception which one conveys by simply keeping still and concealing the truth. Many obstinate truth-mongers indulge in this dissipation, imagining that if they speak no lie, they lie not at all. In that far country where I once lived, there was a lovely spirit, a lady whose impulses were always high and pure, and whose character answered to them. One day I was there at dinner, and remarked in a general way that we are all liars. She was amazed, and said, Not all. It was before Pinafore's time, so I did not make the response which would naturally follow in our day, but frankly said, Yes, all. We are all liars. There are no exceptions. She looked almost offended. Why, do you include me? Certainly, I said. I think you even rank as an expert. She said, shh, shh, the children. So the subject was changed in deference to the children's presence, and we went on talking about other things. But as soon as the young people were out of the way, the lady came warmly back to the matter, and said, "'I have made a rule of my life to never tell a lie, and I have never departed from it in a single instance.' I said, "'I don't mean the least harm or disrespect. 
"'But really you have been lying like smoke ever since I have been sitting here. "'It has caused me a good deal of pain because I am not used to it. "'She required of me an instance, just a single instance. "'So I said, "'Well, here is the unfelt duplicate of the blank "'which the Oakland hospital people sent to you "'by the hand of the sick nurse "'when she came here to nurse your little nephew "'through his dangerous illness.' This blank asks all manner of questions as to the conduct of that sick nurse. Did she ever sleep on a watch? Did she ever forget to give the medicine? And so forth and so on. You are warned to be very careful and explicit in your answers, for the welfare of the service requires that the nurses be promptly fined or otherwise punished for derelictions. You told me you were perfectly delighted with this nurse, that she had a thousand perfections and only one fault. You found you never could depend on her wrapping Johnny up half sufficiently while he waited in a chilly chair for her to rearrange the warm bed. You filled up the duplicate of this paper and sent it back to the hospital by the hand of the nurse. How did you answer this question? Was the nurse at any time guilty of a negligence which was likely to result in the patient's taking cold? Come, everything is decided by a bet here in California. Ten dollars to ten cents you lied when you answered that question. She said, I didn't. I left it blank. Just so. You have told a silent lie. You have left it to be inferred that you had no fault to find in that matter. She said, Oh, was it that a lie? And how could I mention her one single thought, and she is so good? It would have been cruel. I said, one ought always to lie when one can do good by it. Your impulse was right, but your judgment was crude. This comes of an intelligent practice. Now observe the results of this inexpert deflection of yours. You know Mr. Jones' willy is lying very low with scarlet fever. Well, your recommendation was so enthusiastic that that girl is there nursing him, and the worn-out family have all been trustingly sound asleep for the last fourteen hours, leaving their darling with full confidence in those fatal hands, because you, like young George Washington, have a reputation, however... If you are not going to have anything to do, I will come around tomorrow, and we'll attend the funeral together, for, of course, you'll naturally feel a peculiar interest in Willie's case, as personal one, in fact, as in the undertaker. But that was not all lost. Before I was halfway through, she was in a carriage and making thirty miles an hour toward the Jones mansion, to save what was left of Willie, and tell all she knew about the deadly nurse. All of which was unnecessary, as Willie wasn't sick. I had been lying myself. But that same day, all the same, she sent a line to the hospital, which filled up the neglected blank, and stated the facts, too, in the squarest possible manner. Now, you see, this lady's fault was not in lying, but in lying injudiciously. She should have told the truth there, and made it up to the nurse with a fraudulent compliment further along in the paper. She could have said, In one respect this sick nurse is perfection. When she is on the watch, she never snores. Almost any little present lie would have taken the sting out of that troublesome but necessary expression of the truth. Lying is universal. We all do it. Therefore, the wise thing is for us diligently to train ourselves to lie thoughtfully, judiciously, to lie with a good object, and not an evil one, to lie for others' advantage, and not our own, to lie healingly, charitably, humanely, not cruelly, hurtfully, maliciously, to lie gracefully and graciously, not awkwardly and clumsily. To lie firmly, frankly, squarely, with head erect. 
not haltingly, tortuously, with pusillanimous mien, as being ashamed of our high calling. Then shall we be rid of the rank and pestilent truth that is rotting the land. Then shall we be great and good and beautiful and worthy dwellers in a world where even benign nature habitually lies, except when she promises execrable weather. Then, but am I but a new and feeble student in this gracious art, I cannot instruct this club. Joking aside, I think there is much need of wise examination into what sorts of lies are best and wholesomest to be indulged, seeing we must all lie and we do all lie, and what sorts it may be best to avoid, and this is a thing which I feel I can confidently put into the hands of this experienced club, a wry body, who may be termed, in this regard, and without undue flattery, old masters. End of On the Decay of the Art of Lying by Mark Twain This is a LibriVox recording and all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, more LibriVox recordings, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording read for you by Perry Clayton. Punch Brothers Punch by Mark Twain Will the reader please to cast his eye over the following lines and see if he can discover anything harmful in them? Conductor, when you receive a fare, punch in the presence of the passenger. A blue trip slip for an eight-cent fare, a buff trip slip for a six-cent fare, a pink trip slip for a three-cent fare, punch in the presence of the passenger. Punch, brothers, punch with care, punch in the presence of the passenger. I came across these jingling rhymes in a newspaper a while ago and read them a couple of times. They took instant and entire possession of me. All through breakfast they went waltzing through my brain, and when at last I rolled up my napkin, I could not tell whether I had eaten or not. I had carefully laid out my day's work the day before, thrilling tragedy in the novel which I am writing. I went to my den to begin my deed of blood. I took up my pen, but all I could get it to say was, Punch in the presence of the passenger! I fought hard for an hour, but it was useless. My head kept humming. A blue trip slip for an eight-cent fare, a buff trip slip for a six-cent fare, and so on and so on, without peace or respite. The day's work was ruined. I could see that plainly enough. I gave up and drifted downtown, and presently discovered that my feet were keeping time to that relentless jingle. When I could stand it no longer, I altered my step, but it did no good. Those rhymes accommodated themselves to the new step and went on harassing me just as before. I returned home and suffered all the afternoon, suffered all through an unconscious and unrefreshing dinner, suffered and cried and jingled all through the evening, went to bed and rolled, tossed and jingled right along, the same as ever, got up at midnight, frantic, and tried to read, but there was nothing visible upon the whirling page except punch, punch in the presence of the passenger. By sunrise I was out of my mind and everybody marveled and was distressed at the idiotic burden of my ravings. Punch, oh, punch! Punch in the presence of the passenger! Two days later, on a Saturday morning, I arose a tottering wreck and went forth to fulfill an engagement with a valued friend, the Reverend, to walk to Talcott Tower, ten miles distant. He stared at me but asked no questions. We started. The Reverend talked, talked, talked as is his wont, I said nothing. I heard nothing. At the end of a mile, the reverend said, Mark, are you sick? I never saw a man look so haggard and worn and absent-minded. Say something, do. Drearily, without enthusiasm, I said, Punch, brothers, punch with care. Punch in the presence of the passenger. My friend eyed me blankly, looked perplexed, and then said, I do not think I get your drift, Mark. There does not seem to be any relevancy in what you have said, certainly nothing sad, and yet maybe it was the way you said the words. I never heard anything that sounded so pathetic. 
What is... But I heard no more. I was already far away in my pitiless, heartbreaking blue trip slip for an eight cent fare, buff trip slip for a six cent fare, peak trip slip for a three cent fare, punch in the presence of the passenger. I do not know what occurred during the other nine miles. However, all of a sudden, the reverend laid his hand on my shoulder and shouted, Oh, wake up, wake up, wake up. Don't sleep all day. Here we are at the tower, man. I have talked myself deaf and dumb and blind and never got a response. Just look at this magnificent autumn landscape. Look at it. Look at it. Feast your eye on it. You have traveled. You have seen boasted landscapes elsewhere. Come now, deliver an honest opinion. What do you say to this? I sighed wearily and murmured, A buff trip slip for a six-cent fare. A pink trip slip for a three-cent fare. Punch in the presence of the passenger. The reverend stood there, very grave, full of concern, apparently, and looked long at me. And then he said, Mark, there is something about this that I cannot understand. Those are about the same words you said before. There does not seem to be anything in them, and yet they nearly break my heart when you say them. Punch in the... How does it go again? I began at the beginning and repeated all the lines. My friend's face lighted with interest. He said, Why, what a captivating jingle it is. It is almost music. It flows along so nicely. I've nearly caught the rhymes myself. Say them over just once more, then I'll have them sure. I said them over. Then the reverend said them. He made one little mistake, which I corrected. The next time and the next, he got them right. Now, a great burden seemed to tumble from my shoulders. That torturing jingle departed out of my brain, and a grateful sense of rest and peace descended upon me. I was light-hearted enough to sing, and I did sing for half an hour straight along as we went jogging homeward. Then my freed tongue found blessed speech again, and the pent-up talk of many a weary hour began to gush and flow. It flowed on and on, joyously, jubilantly, until the fountain was empty and dry. As I wrung my friend's hand at parting, I said, Haven't we had a royal good time? But now I remember you haven't said a word for two hours. Come, come out with something. The reverend turned a lackluster eye upon me, drew a deep sigh, and said, without animation, without apparent consciousness, Punch, brothers, punch with care. Punch in the presence of the passenger. A pang shot through me as I said to myself, Poor fellow, poor fellow, he's got it now. I did not see the reverend for two or three days after that. Then, on Tuesday evening, he staggered into my presence and sank dejectedly into a seat. He was pale, worn. He was a wreck. He lifted his faded eyes to my face and said, Ah, Mark, it was a ruinous investment that I made in those heartless rhymes. They have ridden me like a nightmare, day and night, hour after hour, to this very moment. Since I saw you, I have suffered the torments of the lost. Saturday evening, I had a sudden call by telegraph, and I took the night train for Boston. The occasion was the death of a valued old friend who had requested that I should preach his funeral sermon. I took my seat in the car and set myself to framing the discourse, but I never got beyond the opening paragraph. For then, the train started, and the car wheels began their clack, 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 clack. And right away, those odious rhymes fitted themselves to that accompaniment. For an hour I sat there, and I set a syllable of those rhymes to every separate and distinct clack the car wheels made. Why, I was fagged out then as if I had been chopping wood all day. My skull was splitting with headache. It seemed to me that I must go mad if I sat there any longer. So I undressed and went to bed. I stretched myself out in my berth and, well, you know what the result was. The thing went right along just the same. Clack, 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 a blue trip slip. Clack, 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 for an eight cent fare. Clack, 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 a buff trip slip. Clack, 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 for a six cent fare. And so on and so on and so on and punch in the presence of the passenger. Sleep? Not a single wink. I was almost a lunatic when I got to Boston. Don't ask me about the funeral. I did the best I could, but every solemn individual sentence was meshed and tangled and woven in and out with punch, brothers, punch with care, punch in the presence of the passenger. 
and the most distressing thing was that my delivery dropped into the undulating rhythm of those pulsing rhymes, and I could actually catch absent-minded people nodding time to the swing of it with their stupid heads. And Mark, you may believe it or not, but before I got through, the entire assemblage were placidly bobbing their heads in solemn unison, mourners, undertaker, and all. The moment I had finished, I fled to the anteroom in a state bordering on frenzy. Of course, it would be my luck to find a sorrowing and aged maiden aunt of the deceased there who had arrived from Springfield too late to get into the church. She began to sob and said, Oh, oh, he is gone, he is gone. I did not see him before he died. Yes, I said, he is gone, he is gone, he is gone. Oh, will the suffering never cease? You loved him too then? Oh, you too loved him? Loved him? Loved who? Why, my poor George, my poor nephew. Oh, him. Yes. Oh, yes, yes. Certainly. Certainly. Punch. Punch. Oh, the misery will kill me. Bless you. Bless you, sir, for these sweet words. I too suffer in this dear loss. Were you present during his last moments? Yes, I... Whose last moments? His, the dear departed's. Yes, oh, yes, 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 I suppose so, I think so, I don't know, oh, certainly, I was there, I was there. Oh, what a privilege, what a precious privilege. And his last words, oh, tell me, tell me his last words, what did he say? He said, he said, oh, my head, my head, my head, he said, he said, he never said anything but punch, 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 in the presence of the passenger. Oh, leave me, madam. In the name of all that is generous, leave me to my madness, my misery, my despair. A buff trip slip for a six-cent fare, a pink trip slip for a three-cent fare. Endurance can no further go. Punch in the presence of the passenger. My friend's hopeless eyes rested upon mine for a pregnant minute, and then he said impressively, Mark, you do not say anything. You do not offer me any hope. But, ah, me, it is just as well. It is just as well. You could not do me any good. The time has long gone by which words could comfort me. Something tells me that my tongue is doomed to wag forever to the jigger of that remorseless jingle. There, there it is coming on me again. A blue trip slip for an eight-cent fare. A buff trip slip for a... Thus murmuring faint and fainter, my friend sank into a peaceful trance and forgot his sufferings in a blessed respite. How did I finally save him from an asylum? I took him to a neighboring university and made him discharge the burden of his persecuting rhymes into the eager ears of the poor, unthinking students. How is it with them now? The result is too sad to tell. Why did I write this article? It is for a worthy, even a noble purpose. It was to warn you, reader, if you should come across those merciless rhymes to avoid them. Avoid them as you would a pestilence. End of Punch Brothers Punch by Mark Twain Read by Perry Clayton